Hey, welcome home. If it's your first time here or if you've been here for months or if you've been here since day one, welcome home. You belong here. You matter. This is a place where you can encounter the love of God with people that love God and love each other. From the moment you stepped in the door until you leave here in a couple minutes, just take a deep breath. Breathe the peace in that's in the room, the anointing, the presence of God that is here, that is evident. He's present. He's here for you in the midst of your situation, your circumstances. Yeah, you individually. I'm telling you, God has a word for tonight. I'm on a Southern Gospel, old school Church of God preaching kind of mood. So you're just going to have to hang in there with me. Don't let the skinny jeans fool you. I'm feeling old school preacher style tonight. So we're just going to roll with it and see how it goes. But for real, welcome home. Shameless plug next week. You do not want to miss next week. That second song they did, that is one of the originals that we're going to record next week. You don't want to miss it. Next Friday night at 7 p.m., we will not have normal service in here but uh, on Wednesday, but we will be there Friday night for the service, so you don't want to miss it. Now, if you've got your Bibles with you, I'm going to jump into the Word. Anybody ready for the Word tonight? Man, anybody ready for the Word tonight? Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to start in verse 14. It says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? Now this is one of Jesus' twelve disciples speaking of Jesus. What will you give me if I give Jesus over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. I want to ask a question tonight. What do you do when someone who is supposed to have your back betrays you? What do you do when the, the church world lets you down? What do you do when a parent lets you down? What do you do when that friend that you trusted all that personal stuff to really ends up not being all that trustworthy? What do you do when the betrayal is a real thing in your life? My title for tonight's message is, Yeah, That Hurt. Yeah, that hurt. <laughs> Listen, we all carry some baggage in tonight, but I believe there's an anointing for some healing tonight. So turn to your neighbor and say, I want more. I want more. That shame, that junk, that anger from the betrayal, the issues, the whatever, I want more. God, if that looks like us having an uncomfortable conversation for a minute so I can get that out of the way, I want more. I'm ready to be free of that anxiety, insecurity, doubt, all the things. I want more. Anybody ready? I want more. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you for who you are. God, I want more. We want more tonight. And we have some situations that have hurt. (laughs) And there is some betrayal and some issues, but I thank you that tonight there is an anointing in the room for progress. So, so be it. Let there be progress tonight. That we would leave knowing that we had an encounter with the living God and with the love of Jesus Christ and having gained five extra friends in the process. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Now, some of my, my favorite minis- uh, memories ever are ministry opportunities. Now, and some of that's just because I'm weird. I'm wired that way. I love church. I love church people. I hope you love church and you love church people. It is funny. Uh, it can be the most dramatic situations. It also can be the most incredible moments where we have stuff like this and we get together and we experience God. And some of my favorite of these moments have come from youth camps. I'm my youth camp people in the room. You will probably hear me talk about youth camp very often because I just love youth camp. I love the whole scene. I love the fall retreats. We just got back a couple weeks ago from the Oasis family vacation. If you were there, you were there. Then you understand. If not, don't worry. It'll come up again and you'll get to go next time. But some of my favorite trips are where we end up driving like super far away. There was one trip when we went to New York and that was just a whole other story for a whole other time. But a couple of years ago, I got to go to Maine, and that was just incredible. Northern New England, uh, up there in the corner, uh, Church of God has a youth camp where they bring all of Northern New England kids together, and it is at the beautiful China Lake. And it's literally like the kids get to go swim in the lake. We had kayaks out on this just beautiful lake in the wonderful weather, and I'm like, man, serving the Lord's not so bad. You know, like it's an incredible experience. Now, the drive up there was a whole other situation. Way too long. Felt like it took three days to get us all out there. (laughs) Jacob was with me. We went that first time and had an absolute blast. And it's so cool. What I love about these trips is when you go out there, you, you know, you take hours out of your time to go somewhere completely different. You're there on purpose. So you've got like, you know, I'm there 
feeling like God's calling me to worship ministry. There's an opportunity to serve the youth that are up there. And I'm like, man, God, I'm, I'm, I'm in a good spot right now. Like God is using me. What's cool is Jacob's there in the same spot. He's like, man, yeah, I'm here to serve and, and God is using me. Pastor Jeremy Geiselman that preached at our retreat a couple weeks ago, he was there. So all three of us together are getting to have this moment where we're stepping into the calling that God has placed on our lives all together simultaneously. And it creates this awesome like family dynamic to where we, I can see Pastor Jeremy, like it had been a year and a half before I saw Jeremy Geiselman again. And when I saw him, we're like, bro, what you doing? Are you changing the world in Chattanooga? Like everything's good. Just so excited to hear what God is doing. And there's this automatic, like our shields are linked, ready for battle. All because we drove 20 hours to Maine and did a week and a half of youth camp, right? There's just something that happens when you do ministry together that causes this tight friendship. <laughs> Again, my favorite memories really do come from these trips. I got to go back to Maine a year later and I took a buddy with me. Some of you know Darius. Uh, he went with us on this trip and we, were, we got all the way out there and we finally got to stop and get dinner at like 7.30, 8 o'clock. We stop in this place and get seafood and he was so hungry and he threw down whatever we ordered. And then he looked at me, he was like, am I allowed to get dessert? And I'm like, bro, like, what do you pray about it? Right? Like, what do you think? Like, of course, get dessert, right? Like we drove you all the way out here. Probably not going to be able to pay you all that well. Like get yourself some cheesecake, right? Like that's where my head is at. So dude orders whatever dessert it was and uh, the, the, the waitress brings it by and I kid you not, he goes, I love you. So then we're feeling a little uncomfortable already because he's trying to bring a girl back to Knoxville with him just because she brought him some pie. But the conversation continues on. He gets about halfway through this pie and at one point he sat the spoon down and he just looked at it. And with complete seriousness, Darius goes, that is a good thing I did there. I was like, that is a good thing I just did. I like literally, if you could have been sitting there, he's talking to himself like he just gave a homeless man a jacket. Like, he's like, yeah, that is a good thing I just did there. And if you spend time with me and we ever go to eat anywhere, you've probably heard me say that statement at some point. Because it's so ingrained from the silly trip we took to do ministry. There's relationship equity here, right? There are times in life where you get to do life with people and it brings this proximity, this special intimate relationship. We served the Lord together and the favorite memories come out of that. Well, can you imagine Jesus' current situation? Because he lives his life for 30 years. God calls him, or it's time, you're really stepping into this full-blown ministry for the next three years. And the first thing he does is he goes and gets 12 guys to come along with him. So he lived like, if you'll allow me to make the comparison, he lived in youth camp mode for three years, right? It's just constant ministry with these guys. They've traveled all over the place. It's his ride or die. His closest friends. And one of them just completely pulled the rug out from under him. Now, Jesus, who was both completely God and completely human, has a whole lot going through his head. And maybe you've been in the same spot. Maybe you're there right now. Now, we did life together. We did ministry together. I've known you a minute and you betrayed me. That hits hard. It hits really hard. But tonight, I believe that God has given me um, three things that are impacted when we experience betrayal. It's three things specifically that Jesus wants to heal tonight. Where are my note takers in the room? If you're not a note taker in the room, it's okay. Tonight's your night. You can become one. We're all, we're all going to go down this journey together and we're all going to get better. The first thing that betrayal does is betrayal causes heartache. Betrayal brings heartache. Again, I trusted this person. I let my guard down around them. I gave them a seat at my table. There is this level of violation that you only know if you've been through it, of what happens when you gave someone trust and it was misused, where you let them in this inner circle with you and it was violated. Uh, but Jesus knows. You see, there was actually some prophetic words that something like this was going to take place that there was an order for this to happen, an order for Jesus to get arrested at the specific time that would then lead to the crucifixion. Somebody had to be the bad guy. 
So I believe to some degree Jesus knows it's coming. He knows that one of the guys is going to let him down. In fact, there's lots of places through the gospel where you kind of get an idea that he, he totally knew this was coming. But then there's Peter. There's a whole other disciple. In Luke chapter 22, after Jesus has been arrested, there's this situation uh, where they start to recognize that Peter was one of his followers. And he completely denies it. And Jesus told him he was going to, which makes it even worse. I don't know if you're one of those people like when you know something's about to go bad and you can call it out and then it goes bad and it's just so frustrating because it happened. It's one of those moments. Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him, had seen that it was going to happen. And then Peter still knowing that he had been told it was going to happen, he still did it. Now it's crazy. Again, you've got Judas who was supposed to go down this road. But then you've got Peter who was one of his inner circle. That in the moment Jesus is most alone, publicly ridiculed and beaten, Peter just, out of fear, completely ignores even knowing him. Maybe you were left out of somebody's life because they had fear of what it was going to look like to other people. Maybe you had a parent that made a decision out of fear and you didn't get the love and the upbringing that you deserved. Maybe peer pressure. Put somebody in a position where that friend left you high and dry. Jesus had spent the most important three years of his life with these men. And man, he denies even knowing him. The important part that I want to point out, though, is how Jesus handled that. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You see, Jesus had this understanding that people are, in fact, people. I went through something a couple years ago that was one of these type situations where one of my closest friends had been bold-faced lying to me and the whole group around him. And it went from like, everything's good and the world is being ministered to by the love of Jesus and we're all in this thing together to homeboy had broken multiple laws and done a ton of just really rough stuff and it caught us all off guard and just pulled the rug out from under me. And I went and got some counseling. And I went and sat with this guy, and he, uh, he knew how to handle me. He, he's a good Christian dude. And he said, look, Caleb, you're a pastor, so I'm going to talk to you like you're a pastor. And I was like, all right, sounds good. He goes, people need Jesus. It's like, okay. Like, duh. <laughs> I go, yeah, I got that. He goes, no, 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 no. People need Jesus even if they're saved. And you got to understand that the blood of Jesus had to be powerful, had to be strong, and is necessary every moment of every day, all the time. And the sooner you will realize that people are going to make mistakes, the quicker you can let go of some things and heal. He said, now that's not, that's not giving permission to this dude for the bad decisions that he's made. That, that's not at all what I'm saying. But what he said was, you've got to understand that there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's the one you expect to be perfect because nobody else is going to live up to that. You see, Jesus knew that the 12 guys he had chosen to do life with him were never going to be perfect. Betrayal causes heartache on a deep level, but Jesus has felt this in his greatest moment of need. And there's no hurt that Jesus hasn't seen you go through. And in fact, he's, uh, he's really good at healing wounds. This world has legitimate hurt, but we know a complete healer. And while betrayal causes heartache, the second note for tonight is that it also causes headache. Oh, man. Have you ever been in a position where you've been so shook by what just took place that you, like, break down completely? This is what I mean when I say that uh, betrayal brings headache. You can be so messed up by everything that just happened around you that it's like, peace out, I'll see you in a month, right? I'm gonna lay in bed and cry and everything else is just gonna have to wait. This depression, this oppression, this anxiety, this junk, it is so real. When betrayal hits at a high level, it can physically shake you. And then it's a domino effect. Let's get super practical. You took three days 
to breathe because it hurts so bad, that's three days you didn't do homework. That's three days you didn't make money at your job. That's three days that you just laid around and got behind. Then it can feel so backwards because now you have to work harder to get caught up when you were the one that got wronged in the first place. And this whole awful cycle takes place because betrayal can cause headache. Have you ever seen the movie The Princess Bride? There's this scene where uh, they're in this ridiculous uh, fire swamp, I think is what they call it in the movie. And there's these massive rat things that are crawling around and the fire just like shoots out of the mud every couple feet. You know what I'm talking about? If you haven't seen the movie, go home and watch the movie. You're welcome. I just blessed your whole life. But there's this scene where they're walking along through the fire swamp and the princess literally just completely disappears into this weird quicksand. And it's not like she lands in it and it kind of slows it. No, she literally just gone as soon as she steps in it. And homeboy that loves her, he looks around for two seconds. He grabs a vine and dives in directly after her. And they're just gone for a minute. And it's the longest, weirdest scene because this hairy, massive rat creature like walks over to the pit and kind of looks around for a minute and then he walks off. And you're kind of wondering like, what is happening down here in the sand? They finally come up out of there and there's a minute of them just gasping for air and trying to live and get through this. Some of us have been drowning in quicksand for a hot minute. But let me assure you, the moment you fell in, he dove in behind you. There wasn't any awkward in between. And it may have been a weird pause in the in between where that weird rat creature crawled across. But he was already in the sand. He was already in the pit head first to make sure that his bride came up out of there healthy and whole. Psalm chapter 40 says from verse 1 on, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. You don't have to hold it all together. You don't have to uh, pull yourself out of this crazy pit that you're in. You just got to hold on to Jesus for dear life. And sometimes it feels that real. It's like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. I'm drowning in quicksand currently. (laughs) And maybe you're there right now. I'm literally head under sand. No idea how I'm going to get out of here. He's already in the sand with you. And he already has the vine to get out. And on a side note, nothing is ever wasted. My note takers write it down. If you don't take another note, you really need this one. Nothing is ever wasted. Now, you will hear a lot of of statements from people that mean well where they'll say something along the lines of everything happens for a reason, right? And that that is us trying to understand God's providence. There is a a lot of complexity and it will make your head explode. Trying to understand how God loves everybody and is just all loving and all incredible that he would send his son to die on the cross so that we could choose to, to spend eternity with heaven in him. This incredible, big, loving God can do all of that. But then there are sometimes where he chooses to intervene in bad situations and sometimes where he doesn't. And that's some like, it'll make your head hurt. And because of that, in situations where bad things do happen, oftentimes we rationalize that by saying, well, everything happens for a reason. God chose to make this happen. Sometimes stuff just happens. We live in a broken, fallen world. The consequences of the fall and sin entering the earth even caused all the crazy natural disasters. Like there's not anything that God just goes like, oh yeah, that was it. You can read Job and you can see the craziness of that situation. And even that had an end goal in mind and a a point where where God said, "You, you can't go any further, right? You can't do more than this. So we try to rationalize the bad situations that have happened by saying that God allowed it to happen. And I, I generally push back on that because Mm. while some bad things do happen because God allows them to happen, you can miraculously watch how even that bad thing gets turned for good. And I have, again, I don't begin to understand 
how all of this works out. I don't begin to, to say like, oh, I've got it all figured out and here's how you handle it. But here's what the word says, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that he causes all things, although he's in complete control. We're all in agreement. <laughs> but in the midst of it, in the midst of the situation, the circumstance, the betrayal, the heartache, the whatever, you're getting stronger because he refuses to let you go through this stuff and come out of it the way you went into it. He loves you so much that he's going to hold you by the hand in the middle of the heartache, in the issue. And even though the situation stinks, he's going to figure out a way to bless you in it because he's just that good. And to quote the great theologian, Kelly Clarkson, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Betrayal can cause such awful heartache, but it can also cause some headache. Don't settle in the mess because Jesus is willing and ready to pull you up out of it. It brings heartache. It can bring headache. And lastly, it brings hesitation. And this is the one that will tear you up if you let it. Betrayal brings hesitation. There's two different ways. Broken trust in, in relationships and even in work environments where you are unable to trust people to keep private information just on a friend level or even unable to delegate. Now, this is something that I really struggled with. When I went through that situation a couple years ago, I really struggled with this because I can be, um, I'm oldest child, 100%. I'm totally the oldest child. I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. That is who I am. Earlier, when Trevor was like, who likes to be in charge? I was like, oh, wait, I'm not supposed to play the game, right? Like, that's what went through my head. I'm like, ah, me, I want to be in charge. I always want to be the one to drive. Pray for my poor wife. She loves me through it. Huh. But when this stuff happened and betrayal took place and I was so shook, the first thing I did is went, And I realized there were things even here at the church that I started doing that made no sense. Things that should have quickly been delegated. Things that I had no business working on. I didn't have to be the one to set up all the pipe and drape. I didn't have to be the one to pick what color the lights were going to be, right? Things that I didn't even realize I was doing, I started doing. And then it was like God was going, hey, homie, like I've sent incredible people that are better at those things than you are. There can be such a heartache that there is a hesitation to let anybody help, even on a friend level. The second way that this really tears you up is in relationships. This hesitation to ever remotely let anybody near you. And not just dating, but friendships. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you. We're going to be bros. We're going to be good but at about right here, right? Like you've been social distancing before social distancing was cool, right? Like you, you, you know what I'm saying? You've been right here. Don't come any closer. Mm -mm. There are a lot of different safety mechanisms. Intensity, anger. You can put up such a front for cancel culture stuff. That's a whole other conversation. You can put up this front that if you look at me the wrong way, I'm canceling you and you out of here, right? And you can have such a hard vibe when really that's a safety mechanism because you're afraid to let anybody close enough to where you're going to get hurt. It causes hesitation and friendships and relationships and everywhere in between. But you cannot live life alone. You were not created to live life alone. Extrovert, introvert, everywhere in between. You cannot do this on your own. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. A place where we can encounter the love of God with people that love God and love each other. Where you can leave here and have encountered the love of Jesus and gained five extra friends. I don't just say it every week because it's catchy. <laughs> it's because this is who we want to be. A place where we can link arms and make it through all the mess. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The moments where the conversations are light and fun and great and dandy. <laughs> and the moments where things are hard where it's conflict, where it's difficult, but we're family. 
And that looks like trust. I believe there's two different roads to reconciliation here, and I really want to land in this. I'm going to close in, in a couple minutes, but I really want to, I want to touch on this before we get there. Super practical. There's two different kinds of reconciliation from uh, betrayal. The first heals that individual specific relationship and allows for healing. The second brings long-term distance from that individual, but forgiveness that allows new individuals in. In John chapter 21, this is after Jesus has, uh, has been crucified and he's risen from the dead. And he has this conversation with Peter, who had just betrayed homie, <laughs> comes back and he asks him this question, do you love me? And he asked him three different times. Now, this was not because Jesus was insecure, right? On our end, that's the question we would want to ask. You just betrayed me. You just ignored me. You just whatever. Do you even love me? Like that, that is not where Jesus is coming from here. What Jesus is doing is he gets face-to-face -face level right here with Peter. And he says, do you love me? I know that you do. So don't walk in all the shame and all the mess from the bad decision, from the issue, because again, Jesus knows he's human. Do you love me, Peter? Or do you know I do? Okay, well, feed my sheep. And the reason that's important, as Jesus had already told Peter, he was going to be a part of planting this church. So he gets back to the beginning. He said, we're good, bro. <laughs> do you love me? Okay, I know you do. Okay, so then don't forget, this is your purpose. This is who you are. Yeah, you messed up. You hurt me bad. But this is who you are. I know it. Do you know it? There's a type of healing that is so frustrating at first. Because you've got to let somebody know that their purpose is still there. You, internally, at some point, in order for reconciliation to take place in these type of drama issues, you have to come to terms with the fact that that person is still loved by Jesus and called by Jesus and has an anointing and a purpose on their life. You got to pray. Because if the anointing and the calling on that person's life is still in the circle that you're in, you got to figure out how to deal with that. I'm going to move on. The second kind, second kind of reconciliation, I'll leave you alone on that one, really does involve some healthy distancing. Some like, okay, we're not, we're not supposed to be in this together. We will have to, we'll have to take some space. I have to get away here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And one of the hardest things to do is to legitimately forgive people. Not just distance forgive people. It is possible to do this whole, I'm going to get away from you thing, and I'm just out of sight, out of mind, and I don't have to think about it. <laughs> but then somebody mentions their name, and you're all triggered and angry, and whatever, I hate you, and you're praying that they get in a car wreck, <laughs> like that kind of level, like bad stuff. That's not forgiveness. Real legitimate forgiveness. To let things go. To move forward. But there are very real situations where you just got to cut off. And we'll have a whole conversation, if you want to, about how bad I hate cancel culture and how anti-Christian it is. But there is a, a time where you don't let yourself stay in an abusive space. That is not God's will. That is not God's will. And it goes both directions. I have had in the last year, just eye-opening, just eye-opening, I have had more conversations of young men who have been in abusive relationships than young women who have been in abusive relationships. Because hurt people hurt people. And you wouldn't expect that, yeah? But distance is healthy as long as the forgiveness is real. 
And you got to move forward. Why? Because betrayal will cause hesitation to let new people in. And you cannot become who God has called you to be alone. He is all about relationship. That's who he is. You watch it all over the place through the scripture where he brings somebody alongside somebody. And you have this, the three of them, the four of them, the 12 of them, the tribes, right? You have this family that does life together. God has a purpose and a plan and a future for you that involves really great, healthy friendships. That's not just crazy optimism from a goofy pastor. That's honest, prophetic truth. So maybe you need to hear it. There is a plan for your life that involves awesome, happy friends, (laughs) that you trust, that you like to hang out with, that you want to be around. There's a future for your life that looks like a spouse that loves you for who you are. No, really. (laughs) There's a future for you. God has a plan for you. You don't have to settle in the mess. You don't have to just sit in all of this. But you have to be okay to deal with where you are in the reality of the situation. Betrayal stinks, and it hurts, and it cuts deep. Mm. But you get to simultaneously allow Jesus to wrap his arms around you and hold you and hold your hand and drag you through it. I'm going to hold you. I'm gonna let, we're going to cry when we need to. Okay, I'm going to stop. It's like a, mm, like a dad ripping a Band-Aid off, right? It's like, okay, we're going to take a minute. We're going to pause. Like, I'm, like, this hurts. This doesn't feel good. I'm going to love you. I'm going to hold you because this is an awkward situation. It doesn't feel good and it hurts. But I'm also going to make sure we get this thing off of you and cleaned up and a new bandit on it because it's what you need. So I'm going to love you through it. I'm going to hold you and wrap you up in my arms, but I'm going to lead you with my hand through the situation because I love you. Now, betrayal brings heartache, headache, and hesitation, but my Jesus brings wholeness, healing, and hope. wholeness and hope to have really good friends fellas to have a girl come around one day that just thinks you're the greatest thing ever because you are ladies to have a guy that just doesn't ask for random stuff that just likes to hang out with you that thinks you're gorgeous that thinks you're great there is a future for you. Man, I don't know who I'm talking to. There is a future for you. And it's really, really good. It's really, really good. So let's make some progress, right? Let's get back to that that prayer from the beginning. God, I want more of you. I want more of you. Okay. (laughs) Well, what if that's him going, yeah, baby, okay. Okay. Did you forgive him? Because that's what's holding you back. Did you let it go? Because I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> like, let's move forward. Let's go forward. Let's make some progress. Because while betrayal causes all of this nastiness, my Jesus, your Jesus, will not allow it to go to waste and will flip all of that mess. And there is a future for you that is progress, that is beautiful, and that is great. Amen? Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me as the band comes up? I'm about to close. The biggest battle of betrayal is the way that it isolates us from the people that God intentionally put in our lives to bring us progress. And there are two very important steps here, okay? The first is to give it to Jesus and allow him to heal it. And sometimes that's hard. But honestly, I think the more difficult step is the second one, which is to choose to give trust. You got to give the whole mess to him, number one. But then you have to literally choose to give trust. Pastor Craig Rochelle he says that uh, trust is given distrust is earned because what's at stake is time 
there is a future that looks like growth, that looks like healing, that looks like stepping into this calling in a whole other level. And you can keep circling this camp if you want to, but it's time that's at stake. So you get your stuff in order and you let Jesus heal it and then you move on and you choose to give trust. You have to intentionally choose to not place the sins of somebody else onto the people that God brought to you to heal that mess. You have to physically choose to not project the drama and the sins from past betrayals on the people that God brought into your life to heal that mess. You got to let the process happen. You have to choose to trust. Give it to Jesus, even when it's hard, because betrayal can cause heartache, headache, and hesitation. But Jesus can bring wholeness, healing, and hope. Heads bowed, eyes closed, all around the room. Oh, Jesus, we need you, and we want more. We want healing. We want restoration. We want hope. So, Lord Jesus, we lay it down tonight. God, and I know it because I've had conversations with people. There's some real stuff in this room. There has been abuse. There has been betrayal. There's been some Judas and Peter level issues in the house. So, God, I ask Jesus that because you have been there, done that, you would wrap your arms around us with such grace and such love and such compassion. But Jesus, I thank you so much for your hand that will lead us out of it to a future and to growth. So tonight, if that's you, heads bowed, if you'd say, man, Pastor Caleb, I've had a hard time trusting. I've been wronged, I've been betrayed, and I'm gonna give it to Jesus tonight. If that's you, will you throw your hand up for me? Yeah, come on, hands up all around the room. Hands up all around the room, you are not alone. You are not alone. God, let that hand that is raised be an action, an act of surrender. Hands up all across the room, all across the room. Come on, hands up as we go into worship. God, this is our surrender right here, right now, to give you all the mess, all the junk, all the heartache, all the betrayal, to lay it all at your feet, Jesus. We want to look more like you. We want to know you better. So we choose to lay it all at your feet, all at the cross, all at the cross. And we trade mourning for joy. We take your beauty for our ashes. God, we trade with you tonight. So bring healing instantaneous, immediate healing tonight from all the wrongs that have been done, that you would give us grace to forgive others as you forgive us, that progress would be made tonight. We love you, Lord, and we choose you tonight. In Jesus' name.